and welcome to a brand new episode of Talking Law from Women in the Law UK. I'm Sally Penny, a barrister based in Manchester at Kenworthy's Chambers and a joint vice chair of the Association of Women Barristers. I'm also the founder of Women in the Law UK, an organisation which is passionate about supporting the next leaders in law. We put on regular events, host masterclasses and also enjoy an annual dinner and conference. Do come and learn more about what we do at womeninthelawuk.com. You could also connect with us on social media. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us on LinkedIn. Just search for Women in the Law UK. On this episode of Talking Law, I was really excited to sit down and talk to multi-medal winning Paralympian, politician, coach and presenter, Dame Tani Gray Thompson. One of Britain's greatest Paralympian athletes, Tani has had a varied career across so many sectors. So we started by talking about her working life. So I was an athlete for 25 years, a Paralympian. Uh, I competed in wheelchair racing. I, I competed at five games, won 16 Paralympic medals, 11 of them gold. Actually, if I'm being really honest, I always wanted to be a lawyer all the way That's through what? school. I wanted to be a sports person and a lawyer. Did you? Um, yeah, that, that was my dream job. I was going to do law. And then um, I then sort of discovered Loughborough University, which was you know where a lot of very good sports people went and go. And then when I started looking at the degrees they had on offer, they didn't have a law degree, but I really wanted to go to Loughborough. So I did a politics degree at Loughborough, which I thought was kind of close enough. And the plan always was when I retired that I was going to do law conversion. Um, (laughs) And then I had the opportunity when I retired to go into the House of Lords. So I sit as an independent crossbench peer. And I mean, it's, it's, pretty close to the law because we yeah. sort of make it and shape it and um and then I thought actually I probably it's probably not a good idea to do law conversion now in case I don't pass or something so um <laughs> I and also to be fair I mean we, we work really long hours so having the time to do law conversion would be quite difficult and so it, it was it was almost my plan to end up in law somewhere my plan wasn't to ever quite be in the house of lords but you know it, it's sort of close enough so your retirement is taken up in the House of Lords. Mm-hmm. Um, just going backwards, really, law has actually been a crucial part of your life since being at school um, and to later on uh, in, in the House of Lords. Last year, when you came to speak at the Women in Law Conference as our keynote guest speaker, you talked about when you were in school and your own disability and really looking at the laws and your parents looking at the laws can you just share some of that with us yes yeah, so I was born with spina bifida could walk a little bit when I was young but then um, I'm actually missing the bones at the back of my vertebra so there's quite a few bones that aren't properly formed so what happened was that uh, my legs never developed properly but as I grew my spinal cord collapsed and it was actually my own vertebra that severed my spinal cord but then paralyzed me so I was paralysed from about the age of six and I was in mainstream junior school and that was all fine. But then when I was due to go to high school, I thought I was going to go to the same school my sister was at. And then we found out that actually children like me um, weren't meant to be in mainstream education and weren't, you know, we were meant to be in special school and locked away from everyone else. So when my parents found out this and, you know, started looking at the special school system, which at the time it it was not a great level of education. You know, the most I could have come out with was a couple of CSEs, you know, and and there wasn't a choice of subjects that I could have done. I couldn't have done any sciences. You know, I couldn't have, you know, there was lots I couldn't do. My parents were just like, this is not the place for you to be. So my dad, very lucky, was educated, read the right newspapers, knew there was someone called Mary Warnock, who... um, had, had written, you know, a lot on education for disabled children, yes. um, had uh, written a, a white paper on education, and my dad basically threatened to sue the Secretary of State for Wales over my right to be educated in a mainstream school. So, you know, my, my first experience of white and green papers, I was 10 years old, and I remember my dad saying to me, you need to read and understand this because this is important stuff, and you know, didn't realise 30 years later that it'd be a massive part of my life. But I mean, what, for me, what was incredible was that by the 30 years later, I'm in the House of Lords, mm. we have a debate which is tabled by Baroness Warnock, which is what's happened in the 30 years since her groundbreaking work on education for disabled people. And I get to sit in the chamber and say, because of you, 
I'm here. Yeah. Um, so it was for me, it was like this kind of big circle, which was amazing, actually, for me to be able to, um, you know, to, to be able to say thank you to her in, in such a public way. Mm. Now, you've become a, a somewhat of a, an activist, really, if I can use uh, that word, probably a bit different to, to Gina Miller. But in campaigning for access rights, you know, disabled rights, I think you were part of the case on access on buses for mm. wheelchair users and various other legislation and testing it. I wonder what was it like for you when you joined the House of Lords, one, as a woman, and two, a, a woman in a wheelchair? I mean, was it accessible? I mean, I've been there with you, and it's, 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 it looks better because you know where you're going. But... <laughs> It's, it's actually a reasonably accessible building. I mean, it's old, so, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but I can get everywhere. I have to say, it's the most equitable place I've ever worked. Um, I, I wouldn't, that's probably not true for every member of staff there, because there is a hierarchy which we have to, you know, do, you know, quite a bit of work to, to knock down, to be honest. But actually, once you appear, then you are treated as a, you know, you, you I, I've always felt quite equal. Um, but, you know, the, we, we have to check and challenge that because it's it is a male dominated building politics is dominated there is a hierarchy and you know I think if we need to evolve and we want to evolve we, we need to sort of challenge some of these things but my personal experience has always been you know very positive and it's hard because you know when you go there I mean when I went there that you don't really get an induction it was basically here's your staff pass off you go and here's the companion to the standing orders which is your rule book um <laughs> So um, some of the stuff I did in the early years was there's quite a lot of naivety around it, where it's like, well, I don't agree with that. I'm going to... So sometimes the energy you need in the building is quite... Because we're on our own. We, you know, we don't have staff. We don't have <laughs> researchers. It's just me answering all the emails. So sometimes it can feel a bit lonely and a bit isolating. But actually, my life as an athlete was a bit like that. So it's, it's just learning to do things in a different way. Yes. Well, ju- just on that, um, I suppose, you know, being an athlete is lonely. Sometimes we get the impression that you're, you know, surrounded by thousands of teams and of course you win and what have you. It- is the reality like then being in-, in the House of Lords where you're doing your own work? Because, you know, the members of Parliament, the MPs, they've got researchers and all sorts of teams, haven't they? Yeah, we um, have a dream of having that. So, no, I mean, because that's the sort of quite traditional way it was based. You know, we, we don't have a budget or support staff for, for any help. So, I mean, as an athlete, you ultimately have to do the training. There aren't any shortcuts to that. So, you know, I do have help from different people with speeches or fact checking or, you know, there's some very kind barristers that, you know, I might ring up and say, does this make sense? You know, yeah. can I sense check this? And that helps. But ultimately, I'm the one responsible for writing my speeches and amendments. So you just have to crack on with it. And you can't you can't do it five minutes before a debate. You mm. have to plan and prepare. So the same way as an athlete, you can't just do it. You know, you can't train two weeks before a major games because actually you won't have made the team. So in, in sport, a lot of it's really dull and boring. And yeah. you know, I'll be really honest, the process of writing speeches is not exciting. And then you only find out on the morning that you, you, you'll have an indication of how long you're going to speak. Um, because you know, if something's time limited, you you start working out the numbers of how many people have got the name on the list. But it's only on the morning do you find out that you've got three minutes, and you have to be done and dusted in three minutes. So it's it's a different time pressure to, to the one I was used to as an athlete. But um, I, I guess I'm used to having to hit times and time targets because that's what you do as an athlete, and that's what you do in the Lords. Yes, absolutely. Um, tell me, because people might not know, but um, the you know those who sit in the House of Lords are not elected, as we know. You are an independent peer, which means you don't belong to any party and you're appointed in your own right, as it were. Does that give you sort of more autonomy to kind of question, object things, or, you know, do, do you, or impartiality perhaps, I think everyone actually has quite a lot of impartiality. And, um, you know, even the party peers, they, they can't do anything to get rid of you. So if you rebel against your party, the most they can do is kind of give you that very disappointed look. Um, so, uh, they, they, you know, the party can make things more challenging for a peer. And ultimately, they could remove the whip, but 
they can't threaten you with deselection if you speak against you know what the leader wants so I think a lot of people feel an amount of freedom I mean within sort of the rules and regulations and we're very very polite to each other you you do have an ability to ask questions to put the minister on the spot you know you've got written questions you know we have oral questions every day and there's been a big change actually and you know now we're online we yes. have more time every day to challenge the ministers so I do feel we have a, a lot of opportunity and when you're working on big bits of legislation you know the ministers are very good at you know making time available the coronavirus bill was different because that went through in two days because it's emergency legislation but normally you'd get six months yes yes you get the bill, you'd, you'd have a chance to speak to the department, the officials, the minister, you know, check and challenge, you know, and, and test the water. So there is an opportunity to, you know, push back. It's, it's kind of, the, but there's just lots of different ways of doing that, which is, is sometimes a bit frustrating and sometimes quite exciting. Yes. Uh, well, I'll come to my own views about the, the bill if we have time. But uh, interesting that, you know, emergency so it's two days, whereas, of course, it, it would be debated and um, longer. And of course, that's why it has to be reviewed um, mm-hmm. every so many days. Now, um, I want to ask you a bit more about your professional athletics career. You have represented your country, our country, as a gold medalist. Uh, gosh, uh, on so many, is it 22 times of 22 gold medals? I may have been making that oh, up. Oh, I don't, I've never, I didn't, I've never actually, I don't know how many times I competed for GB. I know, I didn't, I didn't think that you had, and there'll be, stack, you need to come back to the conference so we can actually see the medals. <laughs> I just, I'll bring them next time. Yes, the weight, the weight of them. But can you share with it, what is it like to take home that gold medal and be in a podium representing your country with the crowds shouting your name, you know, after all this training. What is that? Is that, you know, adrenaline, euphoria, exhaustion? Can you share that with us? It is an amazing feeling, but, you know, you, there's all this build-up to the race. There's some, you know, Paralympics, you, you'll have a couple of years build-up. And, you know, on on the you know, the weeks before, the day before, on the day, you know, there's all these things that have to slot into place about what time you get to the track and what time you warm up and what time you eat and what time you get up. And it's, it's all very process driven. And then, you know, you do the race and you win and you get to do a lap of honour, but there's another race coming behind you. So you've only got so long before, you know, the officials start trying to shove you off the track. And then you have to pick up your accreditation, which you can't go, it's like a passport, which you have to hang around your neck. The only time you don't have to wear it is when you're competing. And then you get your accreditation. You might have to go to doping control. And then you get to do your medal ceremony. So there's a lot of hanging around. which is quite dull and boring. And then suddenly you're out on the podium and national anthem. And it's great. And then basically you're done. And it's like, right, thanks so much. Off you go. You're back on the bus. You're back in the queue for food. If you're really lucky, your mates on your team might say, well done to you. And then it's sort of back to work. So... It, it's quite an emotional roller coaster of the things that you go through, but um, it's a very privileged position. You know, to hear your national anthem played is is a pretty cool thing to experience. Yeah, absolutely. What what do you think about diversity in the law and and in sport in terms of you know, gender and? and race? Because you know, there's a worry that actually the independent fee paying schools do better at pushing, you know, girls and women in sport, for example, than the comprehensive or, the, you know, the state-educated school. Uh, and I just wonder, in our profession, diversity is improving, but it's nowhere near where it should be. What do you think about it in sport? It's the same, you know, it is improving, but it's, it's not equal and it's not equitable. So if you look at coaching, you know, we, we do have a few women at the top of organized sports organizations, but that sort of almost masks the fact that that's not true through each of the sections, through the head coaches, through, you know, all the various coaching levels. You know, there's been a big push to have equality on boards, which is slowly happening. Yes. I've, I've been talking about this for 25 years. I, I said 25 years ago, if governing bodies don't have equal men and women on boards, just don't give them any money. Really, some, that, that sorts things out really quickly. And, it's been a bit slower coming than that, but mm. so I think it's it's useful to know where we've come from, but 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 we're not 
we're not close. You know, we, we don't have the quality that we need. And the reality in sport, you know, a lot of girls drop out because they don't like competitive sport. They don't like maybe the clothes that the sport expects them to wear. And I think we have to find, you know, different ways of doing it. You know, beach volleyball is a sport where the women who play have to wear a bikini. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the rules slightly changed in Rio where they did let a team, two young women, you know, wear um, head covers, you know, and they were allowed to wear long tights and, and long sleeves. But, you know, the, the bikini bottoms in beach volleyball, they have to be no more than two inches measured on the hip. And, you know, the men are, men are allowed to wear board shorts and a vest and the girls yes. have to wear a bikini. So it's things like that that we just need to move on a little bit because, to be fair... If you're an Olympian doing beach volleyball, you're probably quite happy wearing a bikini. But yeah. you know, not everybody wants to. So it's some of those things. We have to change some of the outdated rules, some of the things that I think don't encourage young women to be in sport. And, and I think the reality is, you know, there's a lot of women in sports admin. They just get a bit bored of the fight. Sitting yeah. around in lots of committees, you know, going around in circles. You know, they kind of want to move things on a bit. So there's, there's still lots we have to change to make it better. Uh, absolutely. Tani, tell me, I want to ask you about mindset. We're in COVID-19 as I interview you. Uh, and, you know, one needs to be in the mindset that we're going to get out and we need positive thinking. Tell me, what do you need a winning ma- mindset? What does one need to be a winner? It's actually, it's about having determination. There's an element of, you need a bit of an ego to keep putting yourself through the ups and downs of sport. You need to be, you know, quite determined. You need to be able to deal with success and failure. There's lots of different things. You you have to just, you have to want it. Because actually for the training and, or speech, whatever it is, most of what you do is really dull and boring. So you, you have to be able to not just cope with the fighting bits, you have to deal with the stuff that's that's hard and a bit of a slog. So, um, and you need you need a bit of luck. You you need, you know, just you know something to go your way every now and again. You know, so it's it's a combination of things. I mean, I think one of my biggest frustrations I've seen incredibly successful athletes, incredibly talented athletes, who maybe don't want to train, who maybe only want to train two or three times a week, not ten times a week. Yes. But you ha- you have to have that combination of all those things to be to be successful, and l- a bit of luck helps. But it's it Gary Player and Arnold Palmer both said different versions of, you know, the the harder I train, the luckier I become. Yeah, um, and I think that's that's not everything, but that's part of it. I love that. I love that. Now, tell me about the RCJ, the Royal Course of Justice. Uh, I met Zoe Johnson, Queen's Counsel at Oxford University, when we were on a panel together. And Zoe is a barrister, uh, prosecutes quite a lot of criminal cases, and she is disabled and has a wheelchair. Uh, and we were t- had a conversation afterwards about the state of the court building or the court estate, mm-hmm. which is recognised rightly by uh, HMS CT. But, and of course, there's a move to go online. But I, I wondered if you can just tell me about when you went to the Royal Course of Justice, you know, the the um, pinnacle of of our legal system before the Supreme Court, you know, the Court of Appeals it there. Yeah, what, what was it like when you went there? And, and, you know, what view did you have about access? The access was quite interesting. I mean, we, we kind of had to use a back entrance to get in. And, you know, yes, it's an old building, but it was quite interesting because the, the case I was going to listen to was about bus access uh, for wheelchair users. And a lot of disabled people turned up. And to be fair to them, they tried to put it in a court where there was a bit more space. Yeah. But actually, they weren't expecting the number of disabled people to turn up. So actually, they started suggesting to me that I might like to get out of my chair and sit on a seat and then somebody take my chair away. And it's like, no, that's not happening. Mm. So um, the staff were great, you know, but they're working in a really old environment. And I think what they tried to do is they tried to put us near the accessible toilets, which was, you know, kind of quite kind of them. But yeah, it's it's... There is something that feels very special about the building. Yes. Um, because it's the history and the tradition. Mm. But then there's the other, it's like, oh, slap down a concrete ramp, you know. And I know there's some stuff you can't. But, you know, we, we've got some pretty smart architects and designers in this world that we can put in access that looks nice. You know, I don't want an ugly ramp slapped down somewhere. But, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's some of those things that you've got to be quite tough to sometimes deal with the amount of 
barriers in an accessibility that you're faced with that you have to be quite resilient to to kind of get over them yes and let me just ask you about that you know we were trying to get on the tube once and it was so full and so busy I was appalled by the conduct of you know people who were in such a hurry that you know they didn't always let you on um and we met and so actually what is access in London like? Because, I, you know, when I've been with you on the wheelchair, you're a Paralympian, I'm not. You're pretty fast and you know the routes to go. But is London actually accessible? It's, worth it. it's better than it used to be. You know, it, uh, I seem to be saying that a lot in this interview. So <laughs> you know, it has improved and there's more drop curbs and there's more accessible toilets. But it's not, you know, the most accessible city in the world. But it's, it's old. So, um I, I think what I've seen, you know, there are some very kind people on the tubes who, you know, shove people out of the way and get people to move and are really helpful. Mm. And there's people who were, you know, just a bit grumpy and got their heads stuck down. So um, I think what's true as a disabled person, you have to um, think, you know, you have to plan a lot more. You have to just think about what you're doing. You you can't just jump on the tube the same way as everyone else. But um, it's so much part of my daily life that I don't really notice anymore. You know, yeah. I, I just kind of get on with it. So, um, you know, I, I do get very excited when there's another tube station that becomes step free. I, I do get very, very excited about that. <laughs> well, many of us, certainly, you know, women only really notice these issues when we're pregnant and we're towards the end. And, you know, the, the ability to walk up the stairs or the ability to carry one's cord bag or, or, or whatever. Those are the times the majority of people really notice it unless they know somebody who has access issues um in the main uh, so uh, it, you know I, I was just interested and curious as an awareness point for all of us to just recognize that there are access access issues around the cities that, that we live in i think that's important because um if you're an disabled you just take steps for granted and you know that's some of the challenges that that we still face and you know the, the thing that annoys me more than anything else is any everyone who crams next to a tube door who doesn't move down the carriage. I have been known occasionally to shout, move down the carriage! Um, <laughs> which is very un-British, isn't it, shouting at people on the tube? Um, but, um, you know, I, I do think when you meet people who are kind and caring, it is, it is really lovely. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, the great British public... Um, in the main, our kind, um, let's not forget. Um, Tani, I, I always ask this question, and as a non-lawyer, actually, maybe you can answer it better than the actual solicitors and barristers, but um, I know your daughter's very interested in law, so maybe she has helped or will help you. Do you have a favourite fictional lawyer and why? This is fascinating. So I grew up watching, I'm, I'm probably going to give you a few answers here, Rumpel of the Bailey. Yeah. You know, and that always looked very exciting with the wigs and the gowns and, you know, Rumpel always went in. And then um, another programme, which I don't know if you even remember this, there was a US TV series called Petrocelli. Vaguely. The name sounds, I can't remember watching it. He lived in a caravan because he was building a house forever. And then... <laughs> But it was always like the American courtroom always seemed very dramatic and he yeah. always won and he was always the underdog and, you know, he was always, you know, sort of triumphed. And, yeah, I think as a child you think that's actually how the world doesn't work quite like that, does it? I remember sort of watching sort of those sorts of things and just being quite fascinating about watching the difference between the language in, in British sort of sitcoms uh, about law and the American ones. And then, you know, I have watched the, the LA Laws and the Suits of This World and, you know, my sister's a nurse and, you know, some of the medical programmes drive her wild because she's like, it's not real. Yes, and that's I agree. Kind of the way I, I kind of think with some of those, you, you've got to take them all with a pinch of salt, haven't you? Absolutely, so absolutely. Not, not too seriously. But I, when I was a child, I wanted to kind of be Rumpel. Yeah, that, that's who I wanted to be. Mm, Ray of the Bailey it sounds quite cool. <laughs> yes, actually, that, that could be a book. <laughs> um, come on, something to do in COVID, not that you've not got enough to do. <laughs> um, and what about a favourite book and why? A book that's perhaps had an impact in, in your life? Oh, I read so much because I live in the northeast of England and I work in London, so I spend a lot of time on trains. And yes. I was kind of looking at all my kind of my books. And my husband would quite happily read a book and then give it away to a charity shop where I keep all my books. Yes, um, me too. So 
it's kind of loads. Do you know, the one that I go back to an awful lot is the book I read when I was six years old. And it's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I read it, you know, maybe every 18 months or so, but it just brings back loads of happy memories of childhood and imagination. And it was the book that sparked my love of reading. So I read that and then with my pocket money, I saved up and I went and bought the series of books from Boots. I remember that. Uh, They're 25 (laughs) each. And that kind of just sparked my love of reading. And that led me into loving history and politics and law. Because actually, if you want to be if you want to be interested in law, you need to learn to read a lot. So um, I, I, that, that's the one that just takes me back to a really happy place. Yeah, wonderful. Wonderful. Tony, tell me, uh, what do you do for well-being? You know, you are very, very busy in the House of Lords. You know, you sit with charities, you speak. You know, you do quite a lot. You're a mother, a wife. And you're up and down the trains. What, what do you do for well-being and really to avoid burning out? Um, so for me, it's actually reading is one part of that. It's just having time to read stuff that's different, to brief in papers and you know, some of the, the work stuff I have to read, which, you know, is, is some of it's really tough, challenging, hard stuff to deal with. Physical activity is really important to me. You know, it's very different from being an athlete, but, you know, going to the gym and, um, you know, just going out on my bike, I find really important, really helpful to me just to clear my head. It really does make me feel a lot better being physically active. And actually, you know, in lockdown, it's been fascinating because, this is the longest I've been at home in more than 10 years. Actually, right. I feel I've got more control over my life because there's so many things that I'd normally be doing that it's just, it's not possible to do everything online. So I've, I've kind of claimed a bit more control of my life. So I do feel guilty because I'm really enjoying being at home, but also being able to just, I've got the least number of emails I've ever had in my inbox, which makes me feel really good. <laughs> it's not going to last out of lockdown. But um, it's things like that, just being able to take a bit more control has been really, really good for me. Absolutely. Now, I note that you get sent a lot of books and you read a lot anyway. So, and I wonder if you've got a book, memoirs, or the, you know, the grey years plan to be penned at all? Uh, And if so, maybe a film, who would play you? (laughs) (laughs) See, I sneaked that in there. I'd like to think it would be Angelina Jolie, but it's uh, probably Helen and Bonner Carter because I think our hair are quite similar at the moment. Um, (laughs) I've had a couple of books written about me, um, you know, my time in sport. I do keep diaries, you know, maybe one day. I'm not sure they'll be terribly interesting to publish those. But, um, yeah, I I like writing. So, yeah, yeah, maybe one day, but not, not just yet. Okay. Uh, well, I, I should remind you of it at a, at a later date. Can I ask you about your numerous doctorates that you have from several <laughs> universities? How did they come about? Um, and they're honorary doctorates because you are so inspiring. Firstly, the one from Swansea University. I mean, you've been awarded these because you have, over the last 16 years, a remarkable hall of medals as not only five Paralympic Games, 11 gold medals, four silver and a bronze. Mm -hmm. Um, But you've done an incredible amount of work in the chamber debating issues, including welfare reform, assisted suicide, accessibility Mm -hmm. and equality. So if I start from the beginning, really... It's really interesting. So, you know, at each university, they have a slightly different process. But, you know, universities award a number of honorary degrees a year and they have a panel and they sit and decide who they'd like to give them to. So I've been very fortunate. But then you get to a point where you think, well, how many should I say yes to? And it's one of those things If the university think you deserve it. Then it's actually I think it's quite rude to say no. But um, (laughs) I'm I'm, I'm into my 20s now with honorary degrees. But Helena Kennedy's got way more than me. So uh, not that it's a competition. Definitely not. But um, it's it's lovely. My husband's got a his he's got a real PhD, as he calls it, in chemistry. And and his sort of view is, unless I've had to write hundred thousand words, he's not coming to one of the degree ceremonies. So um, he teases me about that. But um, it's, it's it's lovely because you get to go and spend a bit of time at the university, maybe give a lecture, talk to the students, you know, do some work with them. Um, and it's 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 a really nice connection to be part of their celebration. Absolutely, as is that the great debates you do. Uh, I mean, you've done a considerable amount on welfare reform, 
assisted suicide, which is still a hot topic mm. now, yeah. uh, and really accessibility and equality, which I, I asked you about before, about you know, access uh, and the Equality Act. We know that you're a wannabe lawyer, uh, mm-hmm. as it were, but yeah, you know, how have you found debating those welfare reform, assisted suicide, and some of the bigger issues? Because as a barrister, you know, I'm usually advocating and arguing about them in the court system. It's very different to you debating them and talking about reform and the wording of statutes. Uh, have you really enjoyed them? And, and, and how impactful do you think you are? Generally, I enjoy them. You know, if, if you win a vote, it's it's a really positive feeling. But you're conscious that even if I win a vote, then, you know, there are people who will, you know, very strongly disagree with what I'm doing. I think for me, it sort of came home to me. I worked on Lapso, Legal Aid, Sentence and Punishment of Offenders. Yes. Um, and in the second reading for that, I think I was number 73 on the speakers list. And you look around the chamber and there were probably 45 speakers before me who were lawyers or barristers or judges. <laughs> um, and that's, that's sort of quite, can, can be quite nerve wracking, you know, but actually, you know, bar- barristers have a really interesting way of, of speaking and presenting and they can be fascinating to listen to. So I think it's not been uh, put off by it actually, because ultimately they're people, you know, so um it's sometimes I make a joke in one debate where I just said, my lords, you know, I'm terribly sorry. I mean, this is very House Lords funny. It's not real world funny. You know, I, I regret that I merely did a politics degree, not law, when we were arguing something on politics. But um, yeah, it, it's, you just, if it's something you believe in and you care about, you have to throw yourself into it and you have to do it. And you can't sort of be worried about who you're speaking against. You know, there are some very eminent people who, you know, who have spoken against me in debates, but they do it in such a polite and lovely way then it's not it's not personal. And that's what I find in the House Lords. It's very rarely personal. It, it's about the quality of the debate and it's about putting information across in the right way. You've got to think about that all the time. That's, that's, that's really positive, I think. Yes, absolutely. So finally, I, I wanted to ask you actually about outside interests, outside the, the Lords. You already told me what you do for well-being, but I noticed in the research that you chair... I don't know if you're still on Transport for London or the London Legacy Development, Chancellor of Northumbria University, Mm -hmm. UK Active, uh, basically boards and committees outside of effectively the day job. And how important is it to you to sit on those boards and and give back, if you like? Um, It's important to sit on them because actually, you know, one of the things that was made really clear to everyone who goes in as a crossbencher the thing that got you there, which for me is sport and, and working in sports committees, not just being an athlete, is you've got to remain an expert in the thing that got you there. And so, you know, sitting on some of these things is really important in keeping up to date, keeping in the loop, you know, learning, developing my knowledge. And some of it's a lot of fun. And the other thing, you know, because I, I live in the Northeast, but work in London, I have a very split life. My, my husband and daughter are in the Northeast. So, you know, when I'm in London, you know, I have time to, to, to work on, I'm, I'm a bit of a workaholic. I have time to work long hours and, and enjoy it. So for me, it's kind of important to have that mixture of things that you're interested in. Because what you don't ever want in the Lords is to talk about something that happened 20 years ago. I mean, it's fine if that's what you debate. But, you know, if you're talking about current legislation, you need to be saying, you know, this is what happened last week. This is what happened last month. This is how it will affect people now. Not from a position of knowledge that's years and years out of date. So I think sometimes the current level of knowledge in the House of Lords is not always understood because, you know, people, I mean, to be honest, if there's a picture of, of, of us in the newspapers, it's always at state opening where, yeah. you know, we're in our ermine robe, robes, which to be honest, we've got to rent for 110 quid, you know, so they're not ours. You don't, I don't have my own ermine robes. So, yeah. you know, the image from the outside is not actually the reality and, and doesn't always show. Sometimes the chamber can be really dynamic and others not, but, you know, that, that side of it is, is not always seen, and I think that's a bit of a shame. Yeah. And do you have your own coat of arms? No, I didn't bother getting my coat of arms done. <laughs> I, I don't know what I would have had on it, and it, I mean, that's sort of a bit too egotistical, and, you know, it's, it's a bit of an odd thing, you know. I don't, I don't have a title to pass down, so... Um, and I can't remember how much it cost. It was quite expensive. So Yes, I, I think the research, I was just going to say, I noticed you didn't have one. You know, if you were going to have one, what, what would be on it for the extortionate amount of money? 
There'd have to be a wheel or something, but I'm not sure it'd be very interesting. So I've, I've got a feel. I might have this completely wrong, but I've got a feeling it was ten to fifteen thousand. So you know, I've, I've 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 got other things that I can spend that money on when I earn it. So um, no, I decided not to bother. <laughs> Dame Tani Gray Thompson, thank you so much for speaking to me on Talking Law. It's been a pleasure, pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Huge thanks to Dame Tani Gray Thompson for taking time to talk to me. Thank you again for listening to Talking Law with me, Sally Penny. Do connect with me on Twitter at Sally Penny One. We'd love it if more people heard our podcast. So if you could spare just a couple of minutes to leave us a review, that will help people find us. Until the next episode, do check out the latest Women in the Law UK book. It's a look at how far the profession has come in the last hundred years, featuring career and well-being advice from women and men. It's available now on Amazon to search for Talking Law by Sally Penny. And don't forget to visit us at womeninthelawuk.com for all the latest news about our organization. We look forward to connecting with you. Talking Law was produced by Sam Walker and is a What Goes On Media production. Bye for now.